morning, Vineyard Boise. We're glad you're joining us this morning. My name is Mitchell. I'm the media director here. And I just want to share with you all the ways that you can engage in the service this morning. So we have three ways that you can engage. First is Facebook. Just head over to our Facebook page and you can watch live and interact with other members of the church as well as some of the leadership team. You can also start a watch party and share the service with all your friends and family. Make sure you're following the page so you'll get notified when we go live. Second is YouTube. YouTube makes it super easy to pull up the service on Apple TVs, Roku's, and smart TVs. Just open up the YouTube app and go to our channel and you're all set. This may be an easier option if you're wanting to watch just as a family or just not wanting to see the comments. Again, subscribe to our channel and you'll get notified when we go live. Third is our newest option at vineyardboise.org live. We've added a lot of new features to the live platform on our website to help you better engage. In addition to a great chat feature for the congregation, you can also ask for prayer from our leadership team and then pray with someone in the private chat window. There's also a built-in Bible and easy access to our devotions and some other great tools. Just go to vineyardboise.org live or click the watch live button on the website or the app. If you're new to Vineyard Boise, have questions, or want to connect with our leadership, we'd love to hear from you. Just fill out our online connect card at vineyardboise.org connect, and we'd love to get in touch with you. You can also ask for prayer by emailing prayer at vineyardboise.org. Enjoy the service. Uh, this morning, we're resuming our series in the book of Matthew. We're in um, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, which you can find in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. Uh, today, we're going to be specifically in 6, verses 25 through 34. And, you know, this is an extended sermon of Jesus, and we're taking uh, a few months to go through it because we want to, to take a, a moment to digest uh, every every part of what Jesus has to say and just see if we can't not only understand it but integrate it into our lives. And Jesus is talking about fundamental essential truths that these are at the very heart of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. I think especially, well, every part of it, but these last three weeks for me as I've personally been just finding so much value in them and I think this is at the core of what it means to live as a disciple. And I don't, I don't just mean as somebody who you know, who has the, you know, outward appearance of what people would think of when they think of Christian people, um, but somebody who has the interior reality. Jesus is inviting us into an interior reality that is full of life and abundance. This whole sermon is an invitation to a, a different quality of life than what many experience this side of eternity. And, uh, and, and these are very practical passages for, for how to do that. So uh, anyway, this morning I, I titled the message, Do Not Be Anxious. That's not like a, a super clever and original title on my part. It's actually just words taken directly from the text. But understand, these are in the text three times. Three times in just 10 verses, Jesus says to his followers, and not just the ones that have already committed to following him, but those that are there investigating whether they want to follow him. Just as in our day, there were people who, who gathered to hear what Jesus had to say. Some were disciples. They'd already committed their lives to following Jesus. Others were checking him out, you might say. They were, they were hungry. They were looking for answers. Maybe they were scared of, of the world around them, and, and they were looking for someone who had answers, and so they, were, they came wondering. And in the same way, we have a similar situation. Some of us, are, 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 we know we're followers of Jesus, and we're wanting to grow in that. Others are investigating. And, and to all of those disciples and would-be apprentices, Jesus said the same thing. Three times he said, do not be anxious. So we're going to actually listen to the whole passage uh, to begin with, and then we'll kind of unpack it a little bit. So I'm going to invite Parker Voitsberger to come up here. Parker, you, you can welcome Parker. <laughs> Parker's going to read the passage for us this morning. And uh, welcome, Parker. Glad you're coming up. Thank you. Um, Parker, before we start, what, what, what translation are you reading in? NIV. NIV. And um, I didn't get a chance to ask you before this. Um, what, what grade are you going into? The seventh. Okay. What does school look like for you this year? Does it look different than in years past? Um, it's in school, so I'm not sure. It's my first time there. Yeah. So. First time doing distance school. Okay. So um, I'm curious. I know you... I'm kind of putting you on the spot here. You know, 
You, you saw, is you, um, did you read the passage already? Yeah. Yeah. What's the theme of it? Um, basically, to not worry about yourself and what the world thinks of you. That's right. Not worry. That's, that's awesome. Um, you know, one of the things that creates the greatest anxiety for people is public speaking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Why don't you read the passage for us? I'll hold the mic for you. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink, or about your body. What you will wear is not, is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes. Heavenly, the Heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can anyone of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which there is today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? You of little faith. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all of these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of his righteousness, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first... And all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Amen. This is God's word. Thank you, Parker. I hope you have a... What, what, day, what day do you actually start school? Wednesday, I think. This, this Wednesday? Yeah. Okay. I hope you have a great day. It's good, good, good crazy year. Thanks, Parker. So we just heard Jesus addressing the anxieties of his first century audience. He named a few things. He named specifically, he named the, the clothes we wear, the food we eat, that we eat. And the reality is for, for Jesus' first century listeners, um, many of them had very little besides those basic necessities. In fact, much of their life would have been spent just trying to secure basic necessities like food and shelter and clothing for themselves and for their families. Those things were uncertain in their days, maybe more so than in ours. There was a lot of uh, variables that they were very vulnerable to, uh, things they couldn't control, things like uh, the rain that spring or flooding of the Nile. So understand this, when Jesus is speaking to those things, he's naming He's, he's naming the dominant concerns that are on the minds and the hearts of his listeners. And as I've been preparing about this this week, I've, I've wondered if Jesus was speaking to us today, if he was speaking in our day to a, a 21st century, you know, first world audience, what are the things that he would name as anxieties that we carry? And I think surely basic needs would still be on the list. You know, we, you think about Maslow's hierarchy and those fundamental needs for food and shelter and clothing, those are at the very, you know, our basic needs. But so many people today in our day have an abundance of food and clothing and yet still, still experience anxiety. We call it worry, stress, fear. Many people experience that as a constant companion. They have plenty to eat, plenty to wear, and yet experience anxiety as a, as a constant companion. I thought about it this week. You know, Andrea and I have one of those gravity blankets, a weighted blanket, that's actually quite comfortable. But I thought about, you know, the reality is for many people, they experience anxiety like a weighted blanket that just presses on them. And it doesn't bring comfort. It's constant, but it's surely not comforting. Consider the heightened anxiety being generated by the COVID-19 pandemic in our day. 
This is from a poll done by the American Psychiatric Association. This, is, this was a poll they took in late March. Okay, so this is very much on the front end of the pandemic in the U.S. Uh, it's, it, for many people, this is before or at the beginning of the stay-at-home orders, before quarantine. And yet, already they were seeing rising levels of anxiety in Americans. So 48% of Americans are anxious about the possibility of getting coronavirus. Uh, a slightly smaller percentage are anxious about becoming seriously ill or dying. So you got almost 50% of the population is concerned about contracting it, and four out of every 10 are concerned that they might become seriously ill or even die. And then 62%, a much higher percentage, six out of every 10, are anxious about the possibility of family or loved ones. Maybe not concerned for their own health, but concerned about family members, uh, friends who are uh, in that vulnerable category. So uh, those are anxieties related to COVID-19 that are very specific to physical health. But the heightened anxiety doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop with just concerns about physical health and safety. They also measured anxiety as it relates to mental health, to lifestyle, and to finances. So here's a few more stats from that poll in March. 36% say that coronavirus is having a serious impact on their mental health. So that's over a third of the population said, this is affecting my mental health, stress, anxiety, worry. 60%, almost 60%, 59% feel that coronavirus is having a serious impact on their day-to-day -day lives. I suspect that number might be higher today. 57% um, are concerned that the coronavirus will have a serious negative impact on their finances. So this is a, a measurement of personal finances. 57% said that it, they, they have fears related to that. And then even a bigger percentage, nearly 70% of the population, fear that the coronavirus will have a long-lasting impact on the economy. And I suspect that's a negative impact, not a positive one. So that's just a few stats from a survey in late March. Fast forward just two months to another survey, this one conducted by the U.S. Census Bureau. And they found that 34% of Americans are showing signs of, of clinical anxiety or depression. Okay? keyword there being clinical. This was utilizing a questionnaire that's normally used uh, by doctors to screen people for mental health conditions. And so as they did this poll in late May, the results reflected a significant increase from a similar study that was done back in 2014. So what they're, they're watching levels of anxiety and, and clinical depression on the rise. They even put together this really cool graphic about anxiety and depression levels state by state in the United States. So we'll take a look at that, see if, uh, we'll pull the lights down a little bit here. I don't, know if, I don't know if in the room, if you can see that, it's probably a little bit better image on, uh, on a live stream platform. Uh, but what it shows is there's levels across the board and the best are hovering right around 30%. Idaho, we're actually in one of the, the lowest um, percentages of the population dealing with anxiety and clinical depression. Uh, Idaho, we are at 29% right now, so about 30% about of the population. Um, the lowest states there are Iowa and Hawaii. Iowa is coming in at 26%, Hawaii at 27%. So just one percentage difference. I, I'm not sure... Well, I can imagine why Hawaii would have low levels of anxiety and stress, because it's like, you know, it's Hawaii, like, you know, shaka bra, just chill. Like, well, what is it, you know? So if you're surrounded by ocean, that makes sense. If you're surrounded by corn, I don't quite know what, why the Iowans have it so good. But look down there at Mississippi. Mississippi's at 48%. Nearly half the population of Mississippi looking at, at a questionnaire done by, used by medical doctors would, be, would say they are struggling with, with clinical anxiety and depression. Additionally, the survey showed that some of these, these rates of anxiety and depression, they just didn't just measure them state by state. They also measured them according to population groups, and they found that they were, the rates of anxiety and depression were far higher in some demographics than others. So, for example, some of the highest demographics for anxiety and depression were young adults and also the poor, people in the economic situation. So that makes sense. I mean, just consider the impact on the poor who lack a financial net in the event of, uh, of like, lost employment. Or consider those who, even this week, uh, cannot afford daycare for young children uh, when schools don't open. 
And there's families that are dealing with this. And, and, and so the anxiety level on that of what, how, how do I provide a safe environment for my kids and I can't afford that and I can't quit my job and I feel stuck. Think about those who cannot afford that the anxiety level is rising for, for the, being higher in a, a poor population. If you think about the, what would happen if medical bills come in and compound all the, the, all the financial situation that's already desperate if they had a, a positive diagnosis. So all this it probably goes without saying, right? Not to mention that the, the, the things heightening anxiety in the population at large. Here's a quick list of anxious America. We're experiencing rising levels of anxiety over the upcoming elections, over isolation, over racial injustice, over violent protests, over face coverings and masks, over schools opening or not opening, over environmental decline, spiritual decline, the rising cost of housing, education, health care. Don't forget murder hornets. <laughs> and whether Disney's ever going to do stream Mandalorian season two. Like, <laughs> when? Right? So the point is there's all kinds of things to be anxious over. And I, I looked at that list this week. I put together that list because I thought, again, the question was, okay, Jesus, if you were speaking to a, a, a 21st century audience instead of first century, what things might you name as anxieties, the things that are creating fear and stress. And I came up with that list and I thought, man, must be nice first century disciples just worried about food and clothing. Like, come on, like, this is real. Here's the thing. That passage that Parker just read for us, we heard Jesus say three times to that group, and I think he would say the same thing to us. Maybe he'd say it four or five times. Do not be anxious. Speaking into all this uncertainty and upheaval, all this fear and frustration, Jesus has the audacity. This is the audacity to simply instruct his followers, do not be anxious. Here's the thing. Here's the, so, so the bad news is like, yeah, there's lots of anxiety. We know. Thank you for telling us at church and depressing us, like, right? But here's the thing. Jesus acknowledges the, the reality of what we experience. Think about, you know, the fact that he repeats it three times, and I really do think if he was saying this to us, he might repeat it more than three times because that acknowledges the fact that it's a real experience. Back in the book of Joshua, Joshua and the, the, the first generation, or actually the second generation to come out of Egypt, they were about to go into the promised land. They were the first generation to, to go into the promised land. On the front end of that, before they crossed the Jordan River into the promised land, God told them three times, be strong and courageous, do not be frightened or dismayed. And he kept repeating it. Be very strong and courageous. Do not be frightened or dismayed. Every time he reminded them, it was because he would be with them. But he had to keep repeating it because they were going to deal with things that would trigger and nurture and feed anxieties in them. And so he said it three times. But here's the thing. When Jesus says this, he's not just clueless. In fact, Scripture tells us that in his humanity, Jesus experienced all of the same temptations, all the same troubles and trials that we face in this broken creation. The difference is that Jesus is not limited to the unredeemed and broken creation. Remember, we began this, this whole study of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount with Jesus' central message which was that the kingdom of God was breaking in. He announced that his arrival marked the beginning of the inbreaking of God's kingdom into this world. If this world was a, was a closed system that, that uh, ever since the fall in Eden was subject to sin and death and the repercussions of a fallen creation, it's like the roof of the earth has been torn open and light is pouring in from eternity, that God's kingdom is breaking in and Jesus announces that, and he says, you know what? You don't have to live with this kind of crushing, gripping anxiety and fear anymore because the kingdom of God is breaking in in the person of Jesus. He himself is the doorway to eternal life, and that's not just a, it is a quantity of life. Eternal is definitely a quantity, but it's also a quality of life. Jesus is inviting people to experience eternal life beginning right now. Not, not to the same degree that we will experience on the other side of this life, but eternal life begins now. We get 
down payments. We get deposits on what is to come. And Jesus is fixing what was broken in, the, in Eden. I went back and I looked at Genesis 1 and 2 this week. Nowhere in Genesis, Genesis 1 and 2 is the only place that we see God's creation as he intended it before the fall. Before, by our own sin and rebellion against God, that we, we inflicted sin and death on all of creation, including ourselves. Genesis 1 and 2 is the only place where we see creation unspoiled. And you know what? I didn't find the word anxiety there once. I didn't find any trace of anxiety or fear or worry or stress. You know what we find there in God's creation? We find, well, it didn't talk about clothing and food because clothing wasn't needed back then. <laughs> that might create anxiety for you. Um, <laughs> but you know what, how Eden was described? It was described with the language of abundance. Plenty of water. Plenty of food, fruit on every tree, vegetables being produced from the ground. Like it was just this place of abundance. So we're going to take a closer look, look at what Jesus has to say about anxiety and see if there's tangible things that we can move towards to experience that eternal quality of life that he's offering right now. And again, this is an invitation that you can test him in. There's, there's, people, who, there's, there's people who are followers of Jesus who've not experienced this quality of life. And it's because we haven't tested him in it. So let's listen to what he has to say. First of all, he says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. And there's our first do not be anxious. About your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? This therefore, this passage starts with the word therefore, but it tells us that everything he's about to say is connected to the same passage we looked at last week, the, the, the sermon we listened to last week. It tells us that, that the application is, is tied to what he just said earlier, that it's shaped by what came previously. So what came previously? Well, last week we looked at Jesus reframing treasure. He said, don't, don't set your treasure on earthly things, but set your treasure on things that are eternal or heavenly. With the idea being there's things that people pour their, their identity and their value into that we set our minds and hearts on, that we treasure, and because they're of this earth, they're, they're corruptible. He, he said, moth and rust corrupt, thieves break in and steal. They're temporary, they're disposable, they're stealable, they're breakable, they're fleeting. And God the Father's heart, and Jesus continually, when he talks about God in this passage, he talks about him as our heavenly father. This is, a, this is the parent-child relationship. Our heavenly father's heart is to is to, for, them, for people to not give their lives and spend their lives on things that are not eternal. So his application is this. We're going to look at a couple checks this week. The first one's a heart check. Do not be anxious. How can we not be anxious in this anxiety-inducing world? Well, first of all, go to heart check. If your heart's greatest value and your identity is rooted in things that are eternal, you can increasingly navigate the uncertainties and upheavals of this world with a peace-filled heart. Because this world is not your home or your deepest defining reality. I want you to think for just a minute about what clothes represent. Because when Jesus talks about what we eat and what we put on our body, there's literally uh, a need for clothing. But beyond what clothing is, as far as like covering our birthday suit, th there's, there's, there's something deeper going on with clothing, isn't there? Clothes represent... Uh, oftentimes that we're dressing for others. That's why clothes shopping or even just getting dressed in the morning can produce such anxiety because it's triggering the questions, how do I look in this? What will people think of, of how I'm dressed today? What, what, does, what does what I'm wearing say about me? What does it say about, what will people think of the body underneath these clothes? And, and maybe even more stress-inducing, what do I think of it? And here's the thing. This is, this is one of those things that Jesus says, if you put your treasure in earthly things that are temporary, they'll never satisfy. Looks and the approval of people, those things are fleeting. They don't last. Even when they're really good, even when they're best at what culture says, that's, that's the epitome of what it should be. It's temporary. 
Julia Roberts in the movie Notting Hill, she plays this fabulously wealthy and, and beautiful actress, uh, Anna Scott. And there's this dinner scene where she and, and a group of friends, and her friends, none of them are famous. They're not in the film industry. They're all just very common, very regular blue-collar people. And they're having a conversation about who has the hardest life. And they don't even ask her about her life because, I mean, she's got it all. She's beautiful. She's wealthy. She has it all. And she says, hold on. You don't know what it's like to be me. She says, this is what she says. One day not long from now, my looks will go. They'll discover that I can't act. And I will become some sad middle-aged woman who looks a bit like someone who used to be famous for a while. It just captures the fact that everything that our culture values and says we should aspire to, even for those who have it, it doesn't produce peace there's anxiety for her about the fact that it's not going to last, and she knows it. If your value and your identity is held by your adoring Heavenly Father instead, the Heavenly Father whose love is unconditional, who loves you, who likes you, not for how you look or for what you do, but for who you are. If you root, put roots into that relationship, and into receiving that love, that unconditional love, it increasingly won't matter what others think of you. It won't matter about your outward appearance, how it measures up to cultural standards. If you treasure his love and affection, if you organize your life around that reality, the other stuff won't define your joy, your contentment, your peace. So that's the heart check. Jesus goes on to, to give some more checks, though. Look at this one, the, verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And are you not of more value than they? This is the Father check. It's a relationship check. Consider how the Creator God has provided for the creatures that He made, how much more so the people He made as His image bearers. Remember, you have a heavenly Father who delights delights in taking care of his children. Go back to Genesis 1. Again, God's making creation. He's speaking all of creation into existence. He's making everything out of nothing. He's bringing order out of the chaos. And every time God makes something, he's, he's, he's making the sea and the land and the birds and the trees. He's making things. And every time he makes something, he declares it to be good. And it all builds towards this climax, to the pinnacle of his creation. And he creates mankind in his image. It's only the only part of creation that is actually God's image bearers. All of creation has God's fingerprints on it. It, it reflects his creativity. But mankind alone carries his image. And when he makes mankind, he says, oh, it's very good. Good, 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 very good. If God takes care of other things that he made in creation, if he cares for the birds, if he makes sure they have what they need each day, how much more so will he care for you? Again, this is not a closed universe we, you were living in. Jesus, in, in discussing God's, for creation, God, God's care for creation throughout this passage, he uses the, the more generic title for, for God. He just uses the word God. But when talking about God's relationship with his children, he talks about a heavenly father. A father who's altogether good, who's present, who's kind, who's capable. A father who is powerful and a father who has limitless resources. Listen to this. And this is the, here's, if you take nothing else this morning, listen to this as far as the key to anxiety. You are not an orphan in this universe. You are not an orphan. You have a heavenly father who loves you very much. And he's attentive and he's aware. The shift from anxiety to trust is a shift from, from isolation to intimacy. I'll repeat that. The shift from anxiety to trust is a shift from isolation to intimacy. And Jesus emphasizes that your heavenly father already knows he's consciously aware and attentive to your needs. And not just the spiritual ones, but the really basic practical ones too. It is worth noting, Jesus doesn't promise that the Father is going to take care of every want. He's addressing our needs. 
Verse 27, which of you by being anxious can add a single hour to the span of his life? I like this, the, if you read the footnote of this in your Bible, it probably says that there's an alternate translation. Either which of you can add an hour to your life, just tack on an hour to whatever your, you know, your lifespan's supposed to be. Which of you by worry is gonna add one hour to it? Or the alternative translation is which of you by being anxious can add a single cubit to his stature? A cubit was the measurement from elbow to fingertips for a, an adult man, like a, 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 somebody who's fully grown. So which of you by worry can add this much to your hype? Have you tried that? Jesus here, okay, here's the, here's the key. He gives an incredibly practical and an immediately accessible tool. This question he just asked, it's rhetorical, but it's a tool for confronting the self-talk and the fears that can swirl around in our minds and hearts. Here's why anxiety is so powerful. It often goes unchecked. It often just runs in the background of our operating system. It's just there. It's that blanket that just is always present. And Jesus gives us this tool, this question to, to bring it in check. So this one's the reality check. Ask yourself if your anxiety and worry is going to benefit you in any way or change the outcomes that you fear. The reality is we often let anxiety and fear over what we cannot control paralyze us from acting on the things that are within our control. We sometimes let anxiety or fear over what we cannot control paralyze us from acting on things that are within our control. God used nature to remind me of this very thing. You know, here in this passage, and Jesus is probably, you know, he's speaking on a mountainside. When he's talking about the birds of the air, he's gesturing to things that are really there. Like, this isn't theoretical. He's not sitting in some sterile room. He's pointing to things that people can see. He's like, well, look at that bird over there. The other morning, I was sitting out on our Heritage Plaza out here. It was, it was Tuesday morning. We were having our, our time of worship and prayer as a staff. Um, and this particular morning, we weren't spending time in singing together. We had actually fanned out to pray um, because we were in the passage earlier in Matthew chapter 6 where Jesus talks about spiritual practices done in private for an audience of one. And so we said, let's, let's scatter and let's go cultivate that audience of one. This, this coming Tuesday, we're going to have a, a special time of prayer. Watch for a, a Grapevine video tomorrow um, that we'll talk about, about that because it's going to be something that's on campus only. But as I was sitting there, I was, so I was sitting out on Heritage Plaza. I'm sitting at a picnic table and I'm facing this rose of Sharon bush. And for the most time, my, you know, my eyes were closed. But at one point, I opened my eyes and I noticed this. Look at this. There were these bees. There was this movement hovering all around these roses of Sharon. And I didn't pick up on it at first because it was pretty subtle. But there were these bees. I watched them dancing from flower to flower. And here's what I wondered. And literally, in this moment, I wondered, I wonder if they know about the, the, the bee crisis. <laughs> I wonder if they're reading about the declining bee populations and that scientists are so concerned worldwide about the, the danger of extinction if we don't reverse the trend. There's, you know, there's, there's pesticides that we're using that are killing off the bee population. I wonder if they're really stressed out and worried about that. But no, they just went, they just went about doing the thing that they were made to do the thing that was before them that day, which was to pollinate that flower, that bloom. They were doing the thing that the Creator had made them for and given them to do. They weren't paralyzed by anxiety about real things, that they, that, but things that they couldn't control. They were just giving themselves to the thing that was in front of them that day. Are there real things for, for the bees to be concerned about? Yes, would staying in their hives and wringing their legs. I was trying to figure out, what, what's a bee's news source? I don't know. It's probably like, it's got to be some sort of play on like the latest buzz or something like that. <laughs> but would sitting there reading that and social media acting on it, would, would that change anything? No. They just went out and went about the thing that the, that the creator had given them to do that day. That's, that's the reality check. Will worrying, will anxiety, will stress over real things, is it going to fix anything? Maybe we can just give ourselves to the thing we can control. Therefore, do not be anxious 
This is our last one. Do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the Gentiles, and when, when Jesus uses the word Gentiles, he's talking about people that don't have uh, a personal relationship with God as a heavenly father. Possibly people who are theists, who you know, maybe believe in gods or a creator, but don't have a personal relationship. And therefore, there's a reason for them to feel like they're living in a closed system. Jesus says, you don't have to live that way. The Gentiles seek after all these things. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. That these things, those are practical daily needs. Jesus, and by proxy the heavenly Father, because whenever we see Jesus, he's showing us what the Father's like. Jesus shows us his incredible kindness in that he does not want his followers to spend our days knotted up in anxiety. He doesn't want us to give our lives to anxiety that creates ulcers, steals joy, permeates our bones, interrupts our sleep, wearies our bodies, occupies our thoughts, weighs down our hearts. No, Jesus Jesus in breaking kingdom, breaking into this world, it means that we can experience life differently. Something that Jesus calls fullness of life, abundance of life. And it begins right now. Not, we're not waiting for eternity. And so he gives us one final check. It's this, it's the vision check. Seek first God's active rule, both in and through your life, and then trust him for your daily provision. This is actually what Jesus already instructed the, the disciples in a daily prayer. This is, understand, this is not something you try once and it changes everything. This is a lifestyle. It's the lifestyle that Jesus taught them earlier in the, in the prayer that he gave them. It's the prayer we call the Lord's Prayer. But he taught his disciples to daily, before they ask for their needs, to say, may your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That starts with me and everything that I influence. May your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then, give us this day our daily bread. I'm going to seek you, your ways, your plans, your intentions. And as I do that, will you take care of my needs? <laughs> this is a, a lifestyle of daily prayer where we're reframing our minds and hearts to let go of the anxiety and to, to try him. If this sounds like a bunch of like spiritual mumbo jumbo to you, then try it. Test him. Jesus lived this way. Jesus lived in the same world. Jesus faced all kinds of anxiety. Look at it, look at the life he lived. Look at the, the death he died. Paul picks up the words of Jesus in his letter to the Philippians and he, and he flushes them out a little bit more. And this is the way he says it. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. And then he goes on to say this. Here's, here's the key part for us. The Lord is at hand. Meaning the Lord is near. God is present. Your heavenly Father is present. So do not be anxious. This is where he picks up Jesus' words. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. You know, we talked this morning about anxiety, fear, stress, worry, about it being like this weighted blanket that just covers us. This last Tuesday during our our time of worship and prayer together as a a staff, and many joined us, but there was this word spoken that God wanted to give us a blanket of peace. He wanted to wrap us in a blanket of peace that we can exchange the blanket of worry and anxiety for a covering of peace. 
Paul says, the, the, here's, here's how to do this. Here's a practical way to do this. Bring the Heavenly Father your needs. Bring them to him and to ask with a thankful heart for the very things that concern you. Don't, don't pretend like the anxieties don't exist, but bring them to your Heavenly Father. And he said, when you do this, the peace of God will envelop you because you've turned yourself over to a Heavenly Father who is abundantly able to do more than we can ask or imagine. I'll close with this. This is a quote from N.T. Wright about this very passage. He said, Living totally without worry sounds to many people as impossible as living totally without breathing. Some people are so hooked on worry that if they haven't got anything to worry about, they worry that they've forgotten something. <laughs> but here at the very heart of the Sermon on the Mount is an invitation that surprisingly few people ever even try to take up. Why not learn how to share the happiness of Jesus himself? Jesus modeled this for us. We see this in the garden, not the Garden of Eden, the Garden of Gethsemane. The final moments of Jesus' earthly life as he's preparing for the, the arrest, the trial, the crucifixion. We see Jesus praying about the thing that was a, a place of potential anxiety for him. And he confessed to his heavenly father that he didn't want to go through what he had to go through. He made his request known. And then he entrusted himself to the hands of the father. We've, we've likened it to a two-sided coin where Jesus prayed with both trust and abandon. Unedited honesty, unqualified trust. He came to the father, he said, father, I don't, I don't want to walk the road I have to walk. The, the road that is before me if there's any other way, take this cup from me. But then he, he turned the coin and he said, nevertheless, not my will but yours be done. That's where there's peace. In the midst of a world enveloped in anxiety. God, here's what's creating anxiety, worry, stress, concern for me. Would you take that? And if your solution to that is something other than what I think is the way through, I trust you to do that. That's where peace comes when we can say to God, I, I trust whatever you do. I'm asking you to do it this way. And if you do it a different way, I trust you. In just a moment, the, the worship team is going to lead us in a final song. It's a song that gives us a chance to declare, to make a prayer of this very thing and, and to to declare that we're, we're not going to be a slave to fear because of that parent-child relationship, because we are children with a heavenly father. But I just want to ask you, before we do this, I just want to say, come Holy Spirit. We had some words for prayer this morning. If you have any words for prayer, we'll put them up on the screen. But here's what I sensed. I just sense there's people who, when I describe that anxiety as like a, a weighted blanket that just is always present. It's not comforting, but it's constant. That you identify with that. And there's practical, there's, there's rational explanations to that. And there's also spiritual ones. I believe God wants to set us free. He wants to set us free to live lives of greater joy, of greater abundance. So you might sense this morning that you actually need to ask for healing from anxiety. Healing of a, of a constant worry and stress. To be opened up to experience the joy of an open world. The kingdom of God breaking in. So come Holy Spirit. There's a place in Mark chapter 7 where a crowd brings a man to Jesus and he 
Jesus takes him aside privately. And so there's this private exchange between Jesus and this man. Jesus considers him. Jesus searches the man's heart, knows his thoughts. And then he places his finger on the place of brokenness in this man's life. Can you just picture yourself before Jesus this morning? Allow him to search you, to know you, to lay his finger on this place of anxiety and fear for you. Not for the purpose of shaming you. This is a heavenly father who delights in bringing goodness and joy and life. sense that, that our Heavenly Father is inviting you this morning into being uh, into a greater freedom moving towards moving from anxiety towards peace, joy if you sense that I just want to invite you to respond in some way, you can raise your hand if you're joining on one of the live stream platforms you can uh, speak up Say, I want more. You can ask for prayer. And when you're ready, you can join with the worship team as they lead us in this declaration that we do not have to be slaves to fear. If you're in the room, why don't you go ahead and stand? And um, he's going to lead us. You unravel me with a melody you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love has called my name I've been born again Into your family Your blood flows through my veins I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave
a child of God. Sing it again. You split the sea. You split the sea so I could walk. into this kind of life begins with us entrusting our lives to Jesus. And um, so if you're here this morning and, and you don't know if you've ever made that commitment, maybe you sense you're ready. Maybe you sense that, that it's, you've investigated long enough to know that it's time to act. I just want to encourage you. It's as simple as a prayer of inviting Jesus into your heart. It doesn't have to happen in the context of our morning. Many of us have our, our encounter with Jesus that was that transformational moment. Many of us had it in places that didn't involve anyone else. For me, I was driving up Highway 55 in the cab of my truck. Um, but it's as simple as this. It's saying, Jesus, I, I, uh, I receive the life that you offer. I give you my life in exchange for yours. And, um, and again, that's eternal life that begins now. It stretches into eternity. It's a new life that we just sang about. I've been born again to a family. Your blood flows through my veins. This morning, if you need prayer, if you're in the room, I encourage you to, um, to raise your hand. Our prayer, we have a prayer team here that can move around the room. Be glad to pray with you wherever you are. If you're online, I encourage you to post on the... Uh, on whatever platform you're on and there's people that can respond in prayer. If, you, uh, if you'd like, you can send an email to prayer at vineyardvoice.org and include your phone number and uh, one of our prayer team members will, will call you and pray with you personally. Whether that's for, for healing, whether that's to respond to Jesus this morning for a uh, new life, um, we don't want to miss that opportunity. So um, go out this week and give it a try got some practical ways to take our anxieties and um, give them to Jesus, inviting his life, his will, his ways, and to live lives filled with peace, joy, goodness, and abundance. And then let's go share that with other people. Let's go make the invisible God visible. Amen. Thanks for watching. To respond or receive prayer after the live stream closes, please email prayer at vineyardboise.org. And if possible, include your phone number. We'd love to get in touch with you. Thanks.